live. Welcome to the Sunday session. My name is Steve Judge. I'm the host of the Football Network World's weekly online discussion with football practitioners around the world. Uh, this evening, I'm joined by two top practitioners uh, working out of Holland and the US, Chris Fenker and Andrew Wiseman. Uh, before I introduce you properly to them, let me sort of give you a little bit of background on tonight's discussion, which we'll be looking at who supports the support, the sport, can I say that properly? Who supports the support staff and uh, the well being of, of coaches? Uh, let's share my screen with you. So, I'll give you a, a brief overview of how this evening's discussion will flow. Uh, after I've introduced you to probably to Chris and Andrew, uh, they will give presentations on, on their areas. So Chris, on his uh, sort of lived experiences. Uh, and the problems he's had uh, with his well-being over the last 12 to 18 months. Uh, with Andrew then sort of delving a little bit into the research he's undertaking um, around the topic of well-being for support staff. Uh, once we've gone through that, we'll kind of look, zoom in and sort of identify what are those key problem areas, the, the signs, the sort of signaling, the sort of stresses for support staff and how they are maybe similar or and where they're different to those that you probably sort of recognize in some of the players you work with. And then we'll kind of look at some of the approaches that we can take to sort of encouraging sort of better well-being practices, one as, as clubs, as whole, as whole organizations, and then uh, coaching staff themselves as individuals. What can you do it yourself to sort of better take care of your, your well-being, take control of that. But uh, so that we can get to there, let me uh, introduce you to this evening's guest. Um, we'll start with Andrew Wiseman. Uh, Andrew, all the way over in Salt Lake City, how are you, uh, I'm going to say this afternoon for you? Yeah, yeah, it's just after lunchtime here. Uh, I'm pretty good, thank you. It's uh, just waiting for the snow to come down. Lovely. It's feeling like Christmas already. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, yeah, I just wondered if you could sort of share us then your, your background sort of through, through football, your pathway, which has sort of led you to where your role today with the Utah Royals. Yeah, uh, thanks, Steve. Uh, I guess I probably had a slightly unconventional uh, route into football as, uh, as originally as a player, both in the UK and Ireland and quite a lot of uh, serious injuries, um, which led, led, then led to me in my mid thirties, going back to university and, and this uh, studying sports science. Um, I was lucky enough to, to hold some roles at uh, Charlton Athletic, Stevenage, um, and then progressed on to Celtic uh, in Glasgow, where I worked predominantly with the women's team and the International Academy. But uh, and then from there, I went down to Exeter City in Devon, where I spent the season uh, and then decided to come over here to the, the USA and work with the Utah, Utah Royals. So um, academically, uh, I'm now studying for a, a PhD. Um, I've always seen the academic side as, as quite important in, in my practice. Um, so uh, it's an interesting road ahead. No, brilliant. Yeah, sort of look forward to delving a little bit more into the sort of that academic side and, and where that research is is ta currently taking you. Mm. Yeah. Um, so bring in Chris Venker. Uh, Chris, how, uh, how's, uh, how's your day in Holland been? It's been a beautiful day, Steve. Thank you very much. It's been, um, it's been sunny, not much wind, so um, I was able to do a, a nice bike ride in the, well, in the, the Dutch scenery. <laughs> Okay, I'm not sure whether whether Andrew will be jealous of that. I mean, I suppose there's always always skiing out in uh, out in Utah. Yeah, um, it's always skiing. Yeah, that's the good thing. I, th I think if Andrew is skiing a lot, then I'm, I'm the one that's jealous. <laughs> <laughs> oh yeah, and, and sort of yeah, um, Chris, were you able just to share a little bit with us um, on your your footballing pathway, sort of this, and sort of your your final stop at um, AZ Alkmaar? Yeah, um, uh, well, I haven't been a, a former football player or, or um, in that kind of way. Um, I did, um, uh, I studied sports science and um, 
after oh, during my masters, um, I started to do um, uh, research at uh, at Ajax uh, in Amsterdam. And after two, I think after three years, um, also after the, the the research, I also started to uh, to work over there. Uh, just a small role, doing a lot of uh, data analysis, a lot about um, what do we measure with uh, GPS, uh, what do we monitor, and um, how can we use that um, in regards to um, uh, training programs, and uh, what do we learn from that. Um, and after Ajax, I went to a, a first team that's called uh, Telstar as a, a strength and conditioning coach. So I went from the from doing a lot of data uh, analysis towards more uh, more practical stuff where I was um, uh, well using the data uh, and the knowledge that I was um, uh, was gaining at Ajax. And uh, after one year, I went to the academy of uh, of AZ Alkmaar um, as a um, sports um, uh, as a coach uh, trainer in like the sports science coach trainer. Um, and I was uh, uh, developing a lot of the a lot of the programs for the players um, for in the gym on the field, but also like the uh, the general the general programs um, like uh, weekly, monthly, um, and how to get the players as fit as possible towards um, towards matches. Okay, great. Um, so we're there now, sort of Chris. I'll sort of. We'll sort of let you go first with the with the presentations. Um, we'll sort of yeah, sort of delve a little bit more into sort of how that environment at AZ was for you, and where where it started to become a problem, and sort of a little bit more then of sort of how your your journey into well being through AZ Alkmaar has has come about come about. Mm. Um, so I'm gonna share my screen now. That's what I'm supposed to do, right, Steve? Absolutely, absolutely. So is it up now? Yes. yes. Okay, I see the only thing that I cannot cannot see are the other notes that I made um, below the below the sheets, but I'm I'm sure I'm sure this is gonna be fine. Um, yeah, so as as I was uh, telling um, uh, the last four years, I uh, I have been working for uh, for AZ, and um, yeah, um, it was quite a, a great great job to start with, um, as I still love uh, coaching, uh, training, um, the sports environment. Um, so uh, it had been a great great role, a great job, and and also a great environment in in many. Um, well, in many aspects, um, but about, uh, well, I think that's about the, yeah, I think most of the things that I'm going to talk about is, um, um, yeah, what, it, what is it uh, to work, although how did I experience uh, working in the, in the professional football culture for the last seven years? And um, um, what did it do with me personally, and um, how I got out of this out of this situation? Um, um, so I was I was thinking um, most of the support staff in professional football is always concerned about um, supporting the team. It's always about team performance. It's always um, all the time is going into that so it's priority number one two and three and um it is something that was suiting me well um because um training others coaching others is uh is something i, I really like to do but uh along the way i think um especially the last four years um well i was starting to forget to support myself and I think that's one of the one of the great one of the bigger um, topics of uh, of this uh, this ten minutes presentation. Um, and I think most of the people also in the in the support staff, maybe maybe Andrew will will talk about that a bit more. Um, people who are um, 
are from by nature our our helpers are uh, uh, wanting to support others uh, performing are um, are also uh, mostly people that are uh, at a they say they are they are at the higher risk to um, to forget themselves and get into a burnout. Um, so I think. It is very important, as you also also see now with the current COVID situation in hospitals. Um, the staff over there, um, they are already in a caring um, uh, caring job, and um, well, how is are they still able to take care of themselves? Um, and the way I perceive the um, uh, the, the professional food, football environment. It, that is highly demanding. It is. It it can be crazy at times. Like the amount of uh, of working hours, um, the amount of, of pressure that is on performing, um, is um, well. Uh, we had a we had a little chat just uh, just before um, we started this, and um, uh, well, it might be it might be in a way in a different way, uh, similar to uh, to what players can perceive and. Um, how do we cope with that amount of stress and how, um, yeah, how do you regulate that? So what are we doing with the uptime when we are uh, not only giving a training session, but also have meetings and everything that comes with the job as a, um, um, as a, a sports professional? Um, but do we also have uh, downtime? Do we also are able to take care of ourselves to do something with stress regulation? and um, de-stress well um, I think about two and a half years ago uh, well even further back um, uh, I'm saying um, the second point of, uh, of this sheet is like um, uh, chronic inflammations um, the body is wise that's one of the biggest lessons I've, uh, I've learned and um, it, it might sound stupid because as a exercise physiologist it is my job to uh, uh, analyze the body of uh, of others but um, I kind of forgot to well I, I didn't forget it but I, I didn't pay enough attention to my own uh, to my own body the signals that it was giving me um, so uh, this is uh, this is kind of the uh, how do you say this the a, a, a funny way uh, a funny lesson uh, it is a uh, that that it was also time to uh, uh, stop neglecting my own body uh, because I was getting uh, sick often. Um, just some flu, some colds. Um, I like to I'm, I'm, uh, I like to do a lot of sports, but uh, the time that I was uh, I needed to um, uh, uh, to recover from the sports that I was doing was uh, taking much more much longer than than uh, than normal. So um, I knew that I was under a lot of stress and my body was trying to deal with it. But um, of course, the job has all these demands and um, I, was just, I was just pushing. I was just pushing myself through um, and I thought that I was, uh, that I was performing. I think that's the, that's the funny part now, years later, that um, I had the feeling that I was, uh, I was doing a great job because I stayed healthy. I was able to uh, do this, uh, this, do this job. I was doing 60 hours a week, um, always available for, uh, uh, for players, or coaches or whatever. And I, was, I thought that I was performing and that I was doing a really good job for everybody else except myself because uh, two and a half years ago, my um, uh, I started to get um, rheumatic. Uh, what, do you, what, what do you call it in English? Rheumatoid arthritis. Mm -hmm. I think so. Yeah. Um, sometimes I'm trying to find the find the word switching um, uh, to the English. Um, but uh, which is uh, well, I I've noticed it's a it's a severe severe condition. Um, I wasn't able to uh, to walk anymore without pain. Uh, I wasn't able to do anything without pain. My feet, my knees, my hands, everything was um, uh, uh, was was giving me a lot of pain. So uh, I started to uh, go to the uh, to the normal, like to the hospital. Uh, they said, "Well, yeah, you you have the 
maybe maybe the first symptoms of um, rheumatic rheumatoid arthritis and um, it might get worse it might only get even worse from this point and um, so they started to give me a lot of medic medication and um, to the point that I was getting um, Pretty song is that, uh, that also an English word? Pretty song, I think so. Maybe, maybe not. Is that the uh, medication? I'm sorry, is that the medication? Yeah, that's the kind of medication. Well, it's anyway. It doesn't matter. It is. Um, uh, it is. It is just. A, it is a very severe painkiller. So I was getting those shots every two months, and uh, I was still working I was still doing all the coaching all the hours um, because I thought that I that that I was unbreakable or anything or I would just continue with this uh, this lifestyle um, and um, it eventually led to uh, led to a burnout because um, um, it ended to it, it came to a point that uh, that I wasn't able to do it uh, the way I was um, doing this for the last uh, well four years, but the last two years with the uh, with the disease, with the medicine, um, I uh, I had to face uh, uh, face my problems. And um, so below the uh, topic number three, um, the self support, like. Are we supporting just the others or is it also a very, very important to support ourselves? And there's this metaphor that is um, used widely and a lot uh, about the O2 masks in planes. Like, what do you do first? You first got to put it on your own face instead of um, start giving other people masks and then yourself. So it is a, a nice metaphor for um, what, I've, um, what I've experienced. Um, and I think one of the one of the important um, things that I've noticed in this um, in this burnout situation um, it's about alignment. And um, if you uh, so as I as I told you guys, I thought I was I thought I was uh, performing, and I, I I put coping before that because um, um, yeah, like. I was just pushing through when I thought I was performing, but I was, um, and I thought I was coping with all the high pressure in the uh, in the professional uh, football environment. Um, but in the end, uh, I don't think I was coping with uh, all the pressure and um, uh, with everything that it. Um, uh, well, there was, I was well, I wasn't coping good enough, um, and. Uh, let me do this. Yes, this is easier. I'm just working on my own screen here. Yeah. So, and I was drifting away from my own, like my own values, um, and even away from my own identity, just by just taking care of everyone else uh, except myself in a good way. So, for example, the the pyramid on the on the left. Um, uh, you can use it in many different ways, and uh, the way that I'm going to look at it uh, now is that, for example, if you look at a value um, and the value of health, for example, is for me very important. That's also why uh, I'd like to uh, train and coach um, uh, athletes uh, with their own health, with their own health and performance. And um, my own health was... Um, uh, was down was going down the drain so uh, that uh, uh, that was not in line anymore with uh, what I believe in and I even think um, for example a value connection which is which is very important uh, to me um, I lost connection with um, with even uh, players environment because of the amount of uh, stress and the loads of work that I was uh, trying to deal with so just uh, if I was giving a, a, a training session in the gym or at the field or and a player was uh, wanting to make contact and uh, trying to talk to me about something, um, what would you say? Like, what do you do as a coach? Of course, you're going to go uh, in connection with that player and um, you're trying to help him. But um, 
the amount of stress and the amount of training sessions um, that was well over my head at some point. Uh, I wasn't even able to 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 do those kind of talks and just relax and settle down. And um, I think at that point, um, it is kind of uh, hard to go back and get at ease. And uh, it is very important to get help with that and to not get into uh, lots of stress that is just building up uh, the amount of fear of, well, um, am I able to work here next year again because you're on a, a year contract, for example, or uh, if I'm not going to do this uh, uh, training session or if I'm not going to give training data to a trainer or whatever you got to do for the job, uh, if you have fear that uh, you don't do it in a good way or you're going to lose your job or anything, then um, um, it's not going to help you. Um, so where was the life trend fun? Um, I think that's one of the most important um, things that I've noticed, noticed with myself that at some point, um, I think the laughter and fun went, um, uh, the amount of laughter and fun that I was having in my job, um, that went uh, less and less. I don't even know if that's the, that's the way to say it, but I think you guys will understand. So um, I think health is also about connection and connection is uh, connection with your like with yourself with your body what is your body telling you the, what the, your body is wise like where do you have where do you have pain what does it say um uh, are you getting sick um like if, if if there's a flu around and you always get it why is that um so what is your body telling you? And uh, I think when you are in real connection with your, like with the pyramid on the left, um, with your beliefs, your values, with your identity, uh, I think that is also um, about uh, being healthy. So it's not only about sports or about the amount of muscles you have, but are you in real connection with yourself? Um, yeah, last slide, Steve. Um, so I think the the lessons that I that I that I took from this uh, uh, from these last couple of months um, that I had to had to work uh, on myself and had to take care of myself. Um, it is uh, I read a, I read a book of uh, Stephen Covey and um, I think most yeah, well many people are familiar with. Uh, the story about the goose with the golden axe. It is uh, about the P and the PC balance. The P is performing and uh, the PC is performance capability. So if you have a goose that is uh, giving you a golden egg every morning, um, that's great because you're going to get rich at this moment. Well, every morning you'll be rich and well, you'll get richer and richer. But if you neglect the goose, then at some point the goose will die and he will, won't give you um, golden eggs anymore. So I think that's a, 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 um, an example for an organization, but it's also an example for yourself. Like, uh, yeah, you can sometimes, sometimes the job just has high demands at, at certain times. So you got to perform, but there's got to be some uh, uh, balance in that. So you also have to take care on your uh, performance capabilities. Um, and like we're going to talk about these uh, sports environment uh, tonight, and um, but I think the most uh, important is like who's responsible for this? Well, that myself, I'm responsible for this for this P and PC balance, and I think uh, if real robust changes in uh, any any business environment. Um, those changes gotta gotta come from uh, bottom bottom up. So if many of us are starting to see that we are responsible for this and we um, we are waking kind of waking up uh, and taking care of ourselves, then eventually that will um, go to the top of um, uh, business organizations and sports organizations that. Um, 
uh, that will give a, a produce a robust shift because everybody's believing in that. And uh, for me, the waking up was that I had to work on my immune system. Uh, the last, I think for the last six, seven months, I've been out of, like, I've, I haven't been using any medicine um, just by doing all natural, uh, natural things, uh, food, fasting, exercise, meditation, uh, body work, breath work, cold therapy, like all these things that are, that doesn't cost, they don't cost anything. And there are within our reach, uh, but we mostly choose to, to go for the, um, for the easy choices. But I've experienced now that while I'm doing this, um, I can see that I'm performing at a different level and uh, it is not, uh, my body is performing at a different level. Um, so I can um, I can advise all of you to uh, to my, maybe start reading in that and start not only reading but start doing that start waking up um, and um, yeah I think um, I put some must reads must read books must read well I think oh that's not the proper English I think but um, um, so if you uh, if you're also looking into uh, for into this kind of uh, of living or uh, trying to um, um, yeah trying to start dealing with stress uh, on a natural basis, um, I can I can advise you those five and there are many 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 more um, and I hope uh, yeah I am I'm I'm looking forward to the to the discussion at the end. Thank you very much, Steve. And um, that's it. <laughs> nice. Brilliant. Oh, thank you very much, Chris, for uh, for sharing that kind of personal experience that you've had. Um, obviously, been a, a very tough couple of years, um, sort of coming through that, having that realization that you had had a problem, and uh, maybe that problem had sort of been allowed to go too far, but then to to really address it. Mm -hmm. and, and sort of give us that kind of very individualized mm -hmm. idea around around well-being uh, and what that looks like. I think now and we shall sort of pass the screen over to Andrew and, and maybe it'll sort of be sort of more elements from the organi organizational side and, and what football as a whole is doing looking at well-being, but obviously a few personal reflections as well. Um, so Andrew, yeah, sort of tell us a little bit more about sort of your background that's brought you into your into this research area. Yeah, I'll uh, I'll share my screen actually. Um, let's just get a slideshow. There. Uh, yeah, so I've uh, thanks very much, Chris. By the way, that was very interesting. Um, Sorry to hear that you became ill, and you know that that interests me a lot. Um, I think one thing that that struck me, and some debates that I've had recently uh, during my doctoral studies, are you know who's responsible? Uh, employee employees might say the employer, and the employer might say the employee. But uh, that's something that interests me a lot, actually. And as you see, I've had quite a lot of different experiences. Um, fortunate to have worked uh, both in the male and female game um, obviously here now in the US with the Utah Royals um, with some incredibly talented staff and players and uh, I'm happy to be here not to say that everywhere I haven't have previously worked doesn't have talented staff and players. So I thought I'd start with what a, a typical uh, performance staff structure may look like um, You'll start with the manager there, uh, then we may have the, um, the assistant uh, coaches and a goalkeeping coach, the head of performance, analysis, all these different things uh, generally feed into a manager. In the US, it might be slight, slightly different where you have a manager and a general manager or a club owner or however that works. This is just really a generalization of what could be looked at as support staff underneath um, the manager. Um, but it depends. It depends where you're working, what league you're working or, or who you're working with, really, uh, and the club's philosophy uh, when we talk about performance. Um, so into 
there we go. So if we look at the, the key skills that are probably required on a on a day-to-day -day basis for uh, coaches and support staff uh, in elite sport, there's quite a lot of uh, things going on on a, on a daily basis. Um, and this is by no ways an exhaustive list. There's probably lots more we could add to that. For example, um, you know, one day you could be working with someone in rehabilitation. You're probably planning the rest of the week or the day. You could be working within budgets, uh, different expertise. It's not uncommon now to have different areas of expertise within a performance group um, or performance staff. Uh, you know, you may be collecting data, uh, which we do anyway, every day, but you may be researching or, or looking into specific questions that you've been asked. Uh, but what we have seen is that, you know, the co coaching staff actually play a key role in setting the, the culture. Um, and then that can impact the, the level of stress experienced by the athlete. So a lot of research has been done uh, within coaches and athletes, uh, but very, very little in, in support staff. And hopefully I can, throughout this presentation, I can, I can show you that. So we know that, you know, sports, uh, the team behind the team and performance staff has, has, has really grown in recent years, maybe over the last 20, 25 years. Um, and that's led to maybe a lot more specialists um, within uh, the performance domain. Um, and maybe also a lot of people that consult and, and are outsourced as well. So if you think of that from a, from a player's perspective, there's an awful lot going on, you know, where they're getting their expertise from and that they could be working with within a, a daily basis. Uh, but teams generally take the view that performance staff are there to compete, at, you know, to, to gain a competitive advantage for their players, whether that be strength and conditioning, nutrition, psychology, uh, physiotherapy, uh, athletic training, sports therapy, all those different areas of, of performance and expertise, generally clubs will look, look, look at that as trying to get some form of advantage. Uh, but we have seen an exponential growth in performance teams over the last few years. So if you look uh, just at those pictures there, you've got Manchester City, uh, Celtic, obviously, one of the clubs I worked at, and um, Liverpool. Uh, and Liverpool have been quite well documented over the years how they've expanded uh, a lot of their staff from from data science uh, right the way into the performance domain as well. So um, it can be quite an integrated approach, but it can also lead to be slightly siloed at times, which could cause uh, problems. So uh, one of the areas that was identified about 10 years ago is that of organizational psychology. Uh, my doctoral studies are in uh, that field of organizational psychology and health and well-being. Uh, at U uh, Lancaster University in the, the Faculty of Health and Medicine. Um, but there is a real lack of uh, research in organisational health and wellbeing in, in elite soccer, but in, actually in elite sport um, within support staff. Uh, so as support staff, and Chris, as he said there, we, we spend our time supporting the athlete or athletes or, or team or whoever we're working for, uh, trying to make them better. Um, you know, better in performance and look after their health as well. Because if you don't have a healthy athlete, it's going to be highly unlikely they're going to they're going to perform. Um, a lot of the work at the moment tends to centre on uh, on athletes. So we know that from issues such as mental health, um, that that tends to centre around uh, athletes. Um, and there is some research within recently within within coaches as well, uh, and they vary. Uh, from sort of collegiate level, uh, amateur level, but there isn't that much in the elite level. Um, um, in 2012, Arnold and Fletcher, they looked at um, a wide range of uh, studies in, in organizational stresses in, in elite athletes and found there was, they identified 640, which is, you know, if you're working in a business uh, domain, that's quite a lot and it's probably it's an awful lot for an athlete um to have those stresses um in their in their daily lives um we know that there's a high volume of stresses for coaches as well uh, and they come from quite a lot of different things from contracts to organizational uh, so you know the, the manager would be uh, responsible for uh, picking the team the training sessions but there's also stuff going on there uh, you know with budgets and, and everything else that goes with management um, 
so they will, you know, the coaches, head coaches will also uh, have a lot of organizational stresses. Um, they, they separate earlier research sort of separated those performance uh, stresses into, or sorry, those organizational stresses and demands into performance and organizational. Uh, so performance ones we were looking at there, sort of planning sessions, organizational could be uh, budgetary and staffing issues, uh, which may come under the manager's remit. Uh, but it has been widely acknowledged that support staff do play a, a really important role in not just the athletic success of players, but also that organisational um, and making things tick and, and be that team behind the team that, you know, sometimes uh, I wouldn't say it goes unnoticed, but keep those uh, cogs going and spinning those plates. So this to date is the only study uh, that I know of that looks at um, organizational stresses within sports science and, and management stuff. And the reason I use the word management is within that study, they actually looked, um, looked at performance uh, directors as well. So you could argue that a performance director is maybe not in the day-to-day -day, uh, role of sports science and maybe a different argument. Uh, but they looked at, uh, across 40 different participants. Now, looking at that study again, they didn't uh, define whether these were uh, solely team sports or were they working in individual. They did mention that there were some from uh, individual sports, but they didn't define those sports of, of where, they, uh, where they were working. So it was an interesting study. One of the other things is actually defining support staff. Uh, you know, you could... You could include sports science, uh, physios, again, athletic trainers, sports therapists, nutritionists, performance analysts as well. So I'd, I guess it's how you're going to define um, support staff. So um, it was an interesting study. And um, as they quite rightly pointed out that, you know, the team behind the team were working at various different levels within an organization. Um, so it can be quite difficult to try and work out who those support staff are and where they fit in organizationally. Now, this is some of the results of, of that study and the way they looked at it in a thematic analysis. Um, as you can see, I wouldn't, uh, on the left there, uh, you know, these are things that come up in any environment, not just particularly in a sporting environment, but I think many people working in elite sport may uh, resonate with them, you know, too long working hours, um, lack of job security, role uncertainty, uh, lack of KPIs, um, changes competition schedule, um, you know, <laughs> an autocratic coach, excuse me, <clears throat> Uh, media blame, staff after injury. So they, they broke these down into to four different areas that could be seen as organizing or stressors for that team behind the team. Uh, again, with that, that then goes into uh, two other areas of emotions and outcomes. So uh, what they saw was there was, uh, these were the consequences of the organizers, organizational stressors uh, for support staff and that team behind the team. So you may have the uh, emotions of, you know, frustrated at work, feeling over, uh, nervous of anxiety, frustration, anger. Um, these, may, these are common in sport in such a high pressured environment. And then you've got those outcomes. Uh, so as Chris was talking about there, physical health, uh, maybe a feeling of demotivation, depressed, um, taking work home, um, maybe not having that work-life balance, uh, restricted time for personal care. You know, how do you develop as an individual and what contributes to the club's success? So all these, these, these few emotions that they identified also have outcomes, uh, which could in turn uh, affect performance of the performance staff and their support of the athletes they look after. Uh, while I would say that most support staff, and we're using a, a really broad definition of that, um, I'm still quite early in my study, so I haven't had a chance to nail that down yet. But there are things, you know, a lot of people say that this heavy sporting schedule can affect their home life and work-life balance is a, another area uh, that is, is, is quite prominent. Uh, you know, some people will argue when you sign up to work in sport, you, that, that's what's going to happen. You, 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 you know, it's part of the job. Uh, but do we have that work-life balance or is it all work for nine, 10 months a year? We know that the, these days the, the off-season has got smaller and smaller. 
you know, if you're talking about the Premier League, some or you know, there was instance when I was at um, at Celtic where the men's team there would have two to three weeks off and then they're back in training for the Champions League. Uh, I also heard Virgil van Dijk talking uh, the other week and he was saying he doesn't mind just having two weeks off because it means he can <clears throat> he can keep up with those physical demands. So organisational psychology, uh, it starts to look at the actions and attitudes within an organisation. Um, support staff, you know, we... You, we, we'll get a lot of interpersonal and relationship, contractual performance, de development stresses, and uh, alongside those organizational ones of work, life, and family. So what is acknowledged is that we may, um, especially from the Arnold paper, it does acknowledge that support staff will have the same uh, kind of stresses, organizational stresses that the coaches and players have, all, or athletes have also identified. Um, you know, the, those performance, so there's, you've got the organisational stresses and the performance stresses, and they, the performance stresses may occur due to the demands of the jobs, you know, so pressure to get people back from injuries, pressure to get results. Um, so they, they seem to be intertwined. Uh, the organisational stresses, you know, they're the ones that may have the consequences or could have various consequences for the support staff. And as we spoke about there, you've got the emotions of anger and frustration, and that could be due to a loss or, or an argument or something that's gone on within the team, uh, something you're having to deal with, and then those outcomes. So uh, the support staff's performance, the mental health, the well-being. But actually, there's a lot of challenges when we measure well-being. Um, it isn't particularly... There's no real uh, universally agreed definition of well-being. Um, I think well-being itself can be, um, it could probably encompass uh, both hedonic and eudonic um, components. So hedonic being happiness and eudonic coming from uh, Aristotle many, many years ago and um, talking about uh, you know, the personal qualities and, and, and ways of life. Um, or true self so it, measuring well-being is actually quite difficult there's you know we've seen it measured in 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 athletes but there's probably about 99 99 to 100 uh, from the last bit of research i've been looking at uh, different tools to measure that however they're all with flaws there's all uh, maybe conceptual issues or the way they're constructed uh, so it can be very very difficult and you know measuring something that's quite complex um, you know, will have difficulties. Uh, so when we talk about support staff, there's no, there may be no point trying to measure uh, using a tool that an athlete would use. So something like um, the psychological need thwarting scale. Uh, I've re remembered that one. Could we use that in support staff? Possibly not, because the um, the psychological need of an, of an elite athlete may be different however we have acknowledged that some of those stresses may be the same um you know so there is a you know well-being is a it's a big area it's also inherently complex uh but being able to look at that and uh look at it across your athletes and uh, your support stuff we might be able to understand that a little bit better and and that should help us uh, with sport and those in the organization of sport and those who, who work within that to understand the health and well-being of uh, not just our athletes, but the support staff. Um, but again, it's, 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 really, um, it's really complex. Um, I think how we measure that uh, may, be, may be difficult. Um, as I said, there's only that one paper now looking at the organizational stresses of uh, support staff, but hopefully in the next couple of years, within within my studies, I'll be able to to see that a little bit more, and uh, hopefully get some some research out there, uh, because I think it's important that um, you know I, I think we do acknowledge anecdotally that support staff maybe contribute to the the success of the athlete will on the pitch, but to what extent? Because if you have a, a fit and unhealthy athlete then they're not going to perform. If you have a fit and unhealthy member of support staff, then they're not going to perform. Um, so that team behind the team, I think, 
uh, what's led me down this route to investigate it further to, within a, a, do a doctoral degree is being able to try and understand these stresses that are on uh, support staff and, uh, and, and see what we can do to help that. Uh, that's it from me. Um, I, I'm happy to take some questions and uh, <laughs> it's very early days in, in my doctoral study. So go, go easy on me. <laughs> okay. Yeah. Let's kind of jump into that and, and maybe let's might as well start the, the conversation with the, with the hard questions that you, you pose there and kind of that sort of definition of, of, what well well being is, I guess. Ultimately, I mean, as as professionals, you you want to be getting yourselves into a position of optimal performance. So, within the environment that you are working at, Chris, I mean, how would you have defined what what was possible uh, to to optimally perform in the role you were asked to do? Uh, within that environment, were the things that were just beyond what is possible for an individual to perform or were there other things going on with you that weren't allowing you to perform that you that you were sort of neglecting well it's it's um that's it's a very broad broad question and it's very hard to uh, to give um to give a good good answer direct answer on that steve um uh, I think I think it's um, it is it is both both personally like how do you um, uh, where do you put yourself up to and yeah if you it, like if you uh, start working in professional football as Andrew already said like yeah you sign up for something and um, I think most people who sign sign up with a uh, within this uh, well culture or environment or um, know what. Uh, know what what will happen and what it, what it will ask from them um, but I still think that if we keep going in this same circle and just by keep telling that this is just the environment and this is just where you sign up for um, then uh, that also means that um, that that you get specific people in that environment and um, they might say that they are performing and they are coping well with all the pressures and with with everything that um that has been asked from them um, but i don't think it is still healthy on the long run so um but it's also a personal thing like um i was i was also the guy that that wanted to uh to perform and wanted to go for a big career and if I perform now this year very well I can stay another year and I might be able to do the first team in in one or two years if they see that I'm and I'm able to cope with all this this stress and demands and so it's also a lots and lots of personal traits obviously as a as a practitioner Andrew you're sort of working with the players you there's the sports staff you Again, you sort of mentioned that you're there helping them to manage all their stresses. I mean, what are the ones that you're you're working with that you're looking to manage in others that you're noticing are the same stresses that you're feeling yourself and amongst your your colleagues? I think nobody likes losing. Um, you know, it's as support staff, we're there to to help or you know uh, get those results and try and help the staff so I think you do feel that if you're on a, maybe a bad run and um, you're not winning games then you can feel that a little bit and you know um, it's been acknowledged in sport that there can be a blame culture at times and I'm not saying that's that's every club and, and certainly not where I am but that can happen uh, and I know from other practitioners as well you know it's like oh, so and so's picked this injury up oh, it must be must be this uh, when actually it's again it's a lot more complex than that um, so I think you feel those pressures there can be contractual issues coming to the USA you know renewing my visa uh, while there's great people here you know at a club that look after that for me it's, it's still weighing on your mind especially 
you know, and I don't mind saying it with the political climate in the US and potentially having things turned down. And so their stresses as well, to, uh, uh, you know, and then you've got to, you know, I, I have a, my, my place in uh, over there in the UK rented out and then I'll, I'll hear from the agents that say something's broke and, you know, they want this paying for and they want that paying for. And then I've still got to go and do my daily job uh, and try and push everything to the side from my life to try and help uh, these athletes perform every day. Um, on the other side of that, when you work with the athletes, you know, I, I've met many that say, you know, if anyone thinks that we're at hundred percent every day, that's, that's pretty foolish. Um, and I, I tend to agree with that, you, you know, in any walk of life and any job that you do, you will have days where you just don't feel great. I think it may be that we try and put ourselves in a box that we have to be like that every day. And I don't think there's anything wrong with saying, you know, okay, I'm not feeling it today, but you still have to give the best you can when you're, you're coaching and working with players. Um, so I guess it then comes down to the individual and, and what backup support have they put in place for themselves. Um, you know, some research that I've been reading recently, mainly in, in sports psychology and that crossover into organisational, uh, does point to the fact that sports psychologists within clubs do actually talk to support staff. It's not, they're not just there for the athletes. Uh, so is that support work network well known within a club, within an organisation? You know, do staff members feel feel comfortable going and saying, OK, I want to speak to the psychologist because I'm under pressure, you know, um, because I think it can be very easy to just try and mask that and say, oh, nothing's wrong in my life. And then, you know, you'll leave the training ground or wherever you are and you've got to face life. Um, and that, that is exactly the same for an athlete. Yeah, I mean, I'll say with. Chris, I and mean, we'll sort of get in a bit deeper into the organisational side in a moment. But with with Chris, with your with your situation, and obviously you know you're sort of in an environment where you have the players and players quite often playing with injuries. So you know, you know there is that feeling that people will be performing where they're not, you know, one hundred percent perfect. But so that then plays with you. Does I mean what are the what are the positives of that and and the negatives that it probably gives you kind of like a permission that it's Andrew says, you know, you're not going to be 100% perfect every single day at work and they're going to be ups and downs. They're okay. But when is it, like you say, with your own self, where you're having physical conditions that you, it comes to the point where you just ignore it. Yeah. Well, I think that's the, that's, it, it is, it is okay not to be a full hundred percent every day. And um, uh, I think that is also the, well, like, uh, for me, like, prob apparently, I'm 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 that stubborn that I just push myself and push myself without without listening, and so it is it is okay if you're not hundred percent. And players that are um, that are lots of players that are they are playing a match while they still have um, some issues. They are not hundred percent at the match. Mostly, they are not because they have played another match three days before and three days before that so um and that's not there's nothing wrong with that as long as it doesn't go um, um beyond the point of no return and um if you have um like a, if, you, if players can still get back to their 95 96 percent or i'm just i'm just throwing some numbers out here but um um for me, I was I was minus ninety percent at some point, and I was still like hitting uh, or putting um, eat, taking a lot of medication just to continue working. Um, and what Andrew um, just told about that there is a, a uh, at some clubs or at some organization that there is a uh, psychiatrist there that if you um, are under high pressure as a staff member and you you seek out for help well i think i think that it, that's great um, but as like if i just reflect on uh, well like on my own situation then it is also the uh, that, that there's also a kind of a culture that there might be a psychologist uh, that you can go to but if that is well uh, if if that is um, labeled as being weak or uh, not able to perform or not able to cope with or to handle your own 
like yourself, your own stress balance, your so it is it is not only just by yo, if we put a psychiatrist in place for our staff members, well, problem solved. I think uh, it has much more to do with um, with also the environment, openness. Are we okay to talk about those things? And um, it is uh, well, the the amount of research in this area is uh, is almost nil. So it is um, yeah, a lot of ground to uh, to explore, Andrew. <laughs> No. <laughs> that's, that's a, yeah, like you say, there's a, a lot of open ground for you to cover there, Andrew. Um, maybe specifically with what Chris it's, was saying. It's just, just going to be you, so take all this, <laughs> take all this stress on your shoulders. <laughs> I hope you have a good backpack. It's, uh, <laughs> Uh, you know, a bit with with Chris is, is saying there, uh, a lot depends on on the culture. I mean, you've sort of worked in different countries uh, in men's and women's game. Are there things that are noticeably different within those work environments that, that you've been in, in terms of the ability for people to come forward and not necessarily bottle up problems? And, and I mean, I guess the, the, the general sort of stereotype is that yeah, the sort of men's game is to kind of not show any weakness as, as Chris mentioned. It can be, it can be. Um, again, I think it depends on individuals. Um, you know, uh, some professionals go on and I'm talking players here go on for 20 years and, you know, they understand the pressures they're under and that is their daily environment and they thrive on it. Uh, some don't. And I, I, I've seen some players that, you know, uh, want to get out of the game, you know, because of the, maybe the pressures that, that that happen or go on on a daily basis. They don't like that. They, they'll tell you they like the game, but they don't like the organisation or the, the industry. Um, that's not uncommon. I've, I've heard those conversations before. I think um, we were having a discussion at my university the other day about sort of bullying and, and, and how that works. And, and again, it's how things are perceived. Is it cultural in that way is that how things are done i'm pretty sure that you know most people would be shocked if they went into uh, some uh dressing rooms and some of the things that said between uh players and staff but that can be sport um i think it's really difficult to, to contrast because i've had uh, different experiences wherever i've been um again i think it really does come back to uh, the individual clubs, the philosophies, the cultures, the manager. Um, in here in the US, the organisational side of things. Um, you know, we have a team admin, we have a general manager. Um, is maybe slightly different. Things are run uh, in that way that is different to the UK. So yes, there's a difference there as an organisation. Um, I think again, it depends. It, it's really difficult to answer that. Um, I've seen some things that are, are not great and they make you question, you know, is that is that acceptable? Uh, but when it's between two people that accept it, what do you say? You know, you've got two guys having an argument about something that's happened in training. Most of the time it's just conflict, get on with it because they'll be playing a game of pool with each other five minutes later. Um, so I think it comes down to how we perceive things. Um, so is it difficult? Like I say, I don't think I've seen major differences in a sporting environment uh, but I have seen different cultural uh, elements if that makes sense mm -hmm. um, yeah in a lot of ways it's very unique like you say there's some of those stresses have to be there by design if you're if people are always going to be sort of improving upon themselves that you're always challenging yourself you never really should be at a, a level of comfort uh. <laughs> Um, so with, with your own sort of experiences, Chris, we sort of kind of move on to that kind of organisational sort of level. Um, and I always sort of yeah, be very sort of clear that this is not anything on, on AZ Outmore. And as you sort of said in your presentation, the responsibility here is yours. But in terms of the organisation and understanding that culture, I mean, where, where were the areas where, like you say, it could have been comfortable for you to maybe have had these conversations with someone a little bit earlier, would it, could it, could there have been something that the organization could have had in place that would have made you confront your problems at an earlier stage before it, before it became too serious? 
Um, yeah, like as you as you as you already told Steve, I like um, um, I'm I'm definitely I'm definitely on um, that is like as our, as you as you told like I'm not gonna put anything on um, uh, on the club or any responsibility over there. Um, because as Andrew also also said, like it is it is how you perceive things and it is how you uh, how you handle uh, handle stressors and how you cope with them. Um, and I think that um, a lesson for me is also that I'm that I'm that I need to deal with those uh, with those stressors on a on a different way. And um, if there if there would be anything that a club or uh, the organization uh, could have noticed well looking back um yeah there were there were there were signs as i as i also said in the presentation like um i came in with a with a big smile and a lot of energy and wanted to do uh lots of work and um uh and at the at the end um uh, all this all this joy was uh was almost gone so um i think if um and and, co and colleagues also see those 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 signs so I think I think it's not only for uh, for for the for the club that I that I work for, but it's also in every organization. Like you can try to measure well-being of uh, staff members, or um, but it is uh, like it is it is it is so clear that if some that is that that when a colleague is not um, not feeling well, and that is okay for a couple times, uh, a week or a month or whatever, but. When you see someone just really going downhill, um, yeah, I think it's also uh, colleagues, management. Uh, like you, you wanna, you wanna have this. Oh, there was someone. Someone said that for for players to perform because they are putting that because they are put under high levels of stress, stress, they also need to have a high comforting environment. So you want them to get high stress. But in order to get them on their high stress and high performance, you also want a comforting and an open um, organization that is helping them. And I think the same is for um, for employees and um, the support staff. So if you're under a high stress, you also want to have you also have, want the feeling that some something or someone or the organization has your back on whatever that's going on. I mean, simplistically, Andrew, I mean, obviously there's lots of different thoughts and ideas when clubs are using sort of well-being questionnaires with players and others will just say it's simply enough just to have those welcoming conversations with, with players, get to know your players. And similarly with staff, that if you're having those conversations every day, I, I think I know with, with you, you sort of mentioned that you having those conversations that are just the way from, from football, every day you get to know the people you're working with. So... But even knowing those people, then there has to be those things in place that if you really see that someone has a problem, that, but all right, I think we need yeah. to, to look at this a little bit deeper. What's, what's, what's behind this change in someone's personality or character or energy levels? Yeah, I, I, so I think actually gaining that data that is, uh, can be difficult, you know, um, psychology is is very complex so when someone gives you a subjective questionnaire that says i feel great or well, that's just one tiny little facet of it really because they may not actually be feeling great so i think conversation is good um and understanding your players and your athletes uh, and and to be honest you know other players say to me are you okay and you're like yeah, yeah i'm fine you know because there's a lot going on that you you know you just you're like, no, I'm fine. I'm fine. I just need five minutes and things like that. Um, so I think they do look out for you. What I would say is that, you know, there are various different um, models that are applied in organizational psychology to, to understand things more, something like the job demand resources model, uh, the vitamin model and these different ways. But actually what I'm seeing now is they may not fit with the demands of sport and that, um, you know, being in support stuff where, it is, it is different to business uh, and is different from conventional organizations. Uh, and that's what makes things a little bit more difficult, I think. So you can take, you can apply models to many things, 
but is it actually giving you what you're looking for in sport and the dynamics and the, the day-to-day interactions and what goes on in support staff is remarkably different to the literature, literature conventional literature in organizational health, well-being and psychology. So trying to apply that to sport, I think there's a kind of maybe a bit of a halo effect with a lot of books that have come out about, you know, leadership in sport and culture, which is great, but it isn't always that way. Um, And I think that goes back to what we spoke about earlier that, you know, it depends on the environment and the culture that you're, you're the climate and the culture that you operate in. Um, So it is difficult, you know, could we, you know, some wellness questionnaires that we look at on a daily basis are not, particularly well validated and uh, so that's maybe for a more uh, a different different time but you know can we start to look at those measures I think when you're applying a model of from the organizational field you, you're looking at why these stresses occurring and that's probably the biggest thing that we need to try and look at why are they occurring like we say the only the one bit of research that that is out there as far as I know uh, you know, does say that there are similarities in organizational stresses between that support staff face the same as those that coaches and elite athletes seem to face. So um, should we be looking that way and saying, should we be treating support staff the same and actually gaining data from them? Who's going to look at that data? You know, because that's our job as, as sports scientists and performance staff to take that data, analyze it and try and make informed decisions. Who's going to do that for us? I mean, that makes I mean, a lot of sense. You still want, same as you're looking at sort of the performance level of your of the players, I mean, you still want your staff to be performing at an optimal level. But at the same time, is it that part of the problem that maybe the support staff are looked at in the same way as the players? I mean, to use a very simplistic example would be one where nutrition, where the nutritionists come in. Um, I think I heard a story that over, over during the lockdown, but it was great that the clubs were sending out nutrition packs to the support staff, but they were getting exactly the same food as the players. And obviously they're not expending the same amount of energy. That diet is not a <laughs> healthy diet yeah. for, for a lot of support staff. I'm, support, I'm sure there's a lot of support staff out there that are, are sort, of, uh, sort of expending a lot of energy, getting out on runs and themselves. But for a lot, it's, it's not the ideal that things are not focused on the support staff what their role is yeah i think it's interesting isn't it because you know we're not players we don't have the the energy demands that they'll have in training and games and um it's a it's 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 kind of i I would say it's kind of a gray area where do we sit within that you know we're not the coaching staff as such we're not you know technically and tactically uh, but we still support the players in in our own domains, and that may be physiology, as you said, nutrition, strength and conditioning, wherever that area sits. Um, so it's an interesting point of how you know how do we look at that? How is that viewed within a, an organisation? Is it? And I'm not, you know, could it be that a sports scientist is a requirement for a league or a league licensing? So then maybe as a sports scientist looks at it in a different view than when. Um, I don't know, Jurgen Klopp says, right, I want three sports scientists because that is part of my performance model. So again, those things are going to influence maybe the, 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 the perspective of the organization and, and the staff that work around the team. Um, I'm not, I don't see any re- reason why it should be like that, but you know, anecdotally, it, it, that could influence someone's uh, decisions on those staff. I mean, and Chris, I mean, ultimately, what was, what was it? That, what was the point where it was? It got for you where it was enough, and you were able then to go to the club with your with your problems. And then, what was what was the process from that point? Um, it is um, it is it is always hard to uh, to to ex- to explain what exactly happened. Um, uh, you, you, you mean? I think, I think you mean the at the moment that I was uh, that I had to that I had to quit working, right? Um, I think that's probably there. Yeah, the, yeah. The, the well, point there. I don't know whether there was a point before that where it it came to a head and 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 the process began where they were trying to look to you, but maybe things had just gone too far. Well, yeah, yeah. Good question. Um, 
of, co of course, uh, at, at some point uh, I was I was uh, as I, as I showed with the with um, uh, the sheet with the, the values and um, um, and beliefs that that of course I was I was I reached a point that I was like this is not healthy. I'm a uh, I'm a guy that always did that always did like six days a week of sports, uh, cycling, running, uh, gym, uh, everything. And um, I was feeling I was feeling very healthy with uh, the lifestyle that I was having. And uh, when the uh, when that chronic disease kicked in, um, I wasn't able to do anything anymore. But without with medicine, I would just keep pushing myself through. And there was a point that I was uh, saying to the doctors, OK, I'm going to stop this medicine because um, I think there's another way on treating this um, because I started to read about um, that many, not all, not all um, diseases, but many diseases are just diseases of symptoms. So I had to try and work on my lifestyle. So I was um, starting to eat differently, uh, meditate and all those, all those small things, but it is very hard to get a body that is totally under attack by a chronic disease to get that under control beside a 60 hour work week so i was trying all the all the little things before and after work to just trying to regulate the, the amount of stress that i was having but um and i thought that i was if i would continue that um uh, that it eventually um that i was trying to that i could cure myself from this um but there was a specific point uh, one morning that i was just unable to go to work and that was a very very strong feeling that i was i couldn't um there, there was just no other way i think i tried two hours that morning two three hours to get myself to work and i just tried everything everything i could because i just couldn't believe i was like this is what is going on this is just crazy let's let's just go let's go but um no it wasn't working and um well, from that point on, I, I even intensified the um, uh, the measures that I was the the natural measures that I was taking uh, regarding nutrition and um, and other lifestyle um, aspects. And like in the in the example that she that she just gave, um, it is very uh, it is it is almost kind of a, 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 a habit or an easy way when. Uh, you were talking about the, the nutrition and the food of the staff members. Um, like all the years that I was uh, that, that I've been uh, working in um, uh, in professional sports, if uh, the club provides food for the players during game days or uh, after training, or mo the staff mostly eats the same meals, and mostly it's uh, well if it, if it's good arranged, it's a buffet, or you can choose, but. Um, like what what do you choose and i think that's also a point of where you are totally self responsible for uh, the choices you make over there are you going for the for the high protein food because why would you go for the high protein food is that going to give you the health you need is it going to give you longevity um so i think i've i've noticed now that by changing food and changing um uh, my well-being by doing meditation just to really get connected with myself again um, the the amount that I, the the chronic disease that I was having um, it was it almost well it, it didn't it didn't disappear I didn't cure it um, but I was able to do a bike ride today so um, like those 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 small victories um, just by changing lifestyle instead of going for the easy options like yeah I'll, I'll eat the chicken pasta and because that's no that's not what your body needs as a support staff member so um maybe even not as an athlete but that's that's a total different discussion <laughs> okay I think, well i think we get sort of move into what what we can do as as individuals to take responsibility for well-being a question here for andrew from Anne helen graham uh, and Elaine says, hi, Andrew, <laughs> what is or is likely to be your thesis for your research in this area? And does this thesis come from your gathered own experiences in your various various roles 
or maybe even a specific situation you've experienced up close? Uh, well, thanks for the question, Anne Helene. And I know Anne Helene uh, well from when she was uh, her time at Scotland and um, a great coach and, and a great person. So, um, yeah, I think it's a combination. Um, so, I had gone for two PhDs in physiology. Uh, one fell through due to to COVID, and that was looking at uh, training load and different models of training and um, some other metrics of internal load. Um, but yes, I would say that there's been some personal experiences. Um, you know, I think uh, one thing and just just came to my mind there actually is when you uh, your job identity. So when do you separate from your job identity? And uh, I know that's a different subject, but that was something I had to learn. You know, it's my job. Uh, yes, I love football. It's what I love. I love to play. I, I, lo I love sports science in football. Um, but you have to separate from that. So uh, what led me to the PhD was reading up on, uh, you know, seeing that gap in the research and thinking, actually, working with uh, athletes every day, I spend my life. And there had been conversations that I'd had with other people leading up to me proposing it. Uh, and I, the, pro the proposal is at the moment is, you know, does the health and well-being um, of elite of support staff in elite football contribute to on-pitch success? That may change over the next couple of years because it depends how you define those. But one thing I was thinking is it, you know, we, we've touched on it today. If I'm not giving my best, am I giving the best to the athletes? Am I giving them the very best service that I can? And obviously it's quite simple that if you're not, then you, you're probably not giving that to them. So that then made me think a little bit further. Okay, uh, what affects the staff? Because there was things going on uh, with me personally that I've had with contracts, with other you know, visas and things going on in my life. And then I'm, I'm going into work and going, God, I've got to deal with this, but I've got 28 other people to look after and conversations with front office staff and coaches and um, other members of the performance team that I need to deal with first before I deal with my outside life. So it made me think uh, a lot. I know, uh, you know, I've been at places previously where, um, and one of the questions that come up in the Arnold paper is people questioning why they do the job. And I, I'd probably say that's probably crossed, crossed every practitioner's mind at some point. You know, why, why am I doing this job? The excessive hours and everything that goes with it. Um, so I think um, that's what made me look at. So a little bit of personal experience, but also I, I'm fascinated about, well, actually improving things for support staff. And I'm not saying they're, they're, they're bad, but how can we be better supported in what we do to support the athletes? Because ultimately um, there is going to be a knock-on effect. You know, the more you give and, you know, uh, the more you're able to give to those athletes, then, you know, the chances of them progressing and getting greater success um, may be higher. Uh, unless everything I propose goes dramatically wrong and, you know, I dismiss my own theory. But, um, yeah, I think it's a combination of uh, a little bit of personal experience, but also being very inquisitive um, over what, how we can support, support stuff. I think I sort of jump on something you sort of mentioned there, there, Andrew, in terms of, I may pass this on over to Chris first. In his, in his situation, or that idea that where you separate the role from you as an individual, and I could imagine that you know, sort of coming into AZ, I think one of your first full-time roles, it's kind of getting a for you a dream position. It must be very hard to, like I say, to give give that up, and that you become, you become that role, that position, that job title, rather than Chris Venker. You were more, mm. more focused on that. And as you sort of said in your presentation, less on who you were in terms of your, your values. You were looking at that job spec rather than, than who, who you are and how you, how you sort of then find, find that balance so that you're able, like you say, to take that individual responsibility. It is, um, uh, it, it might be, it might be, I don't know if it, if, if it is just a struggle um, uh, in the football, uh, the the professional football world and sports staff, maybe this is a um, 
um, a theme that every everybody goes through from between 20 and 30 or 30 and 40 years old that you like yeah maybe maybe it's a society thing that we want to have a career and we go for this g dream job and once uh, we get this job uh, we we want to take it even further and um or not but um uh, because the amount of hours that i was putting in um i i became i be well it i i became the job and i became the uh, the exercise physiologist and um that also means that um well, for example i like I, I, I like music i like going to to concerts to rock concerts to festivals and um it becomes this 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 um this question like if can i still go there and if i go there how how like how how should i behave if someone if someone from the i don't know from the, the club or the environment or spots me off is is that a good way to do in the role that i'm well of course it is crazy to think like this but it is um it is maybe a natural natural way um that everybody goes through and um uh, yeah letting letting go is a uh, is uh, is hard but it is uh, very very good to do with those kind of ideas um and i, I was i was um andrew as you as you just told about um talked about the um if if i can jump into a question steve i don't know if that's okay. <laughs> um because i was just thinking um the 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 amount of um of working hours this work-life balance has also has been seen in the um, uh, in the research that you uh, presented, um, I was just thinking: Do you think that? Because do you think that there's also a, a change in um, what people, and not only staff members, but also players from that that are now 19, 20, 25 years old, that there is maybe also a different generation coming through? that has different needs and different demands or what they think that they would like their work environment to be? Yeah, absolutely. A great question. And something I was actually discussing with uh, one of the professionals here um, recently was um, I was listening to something with Gareth Barry and he's played something obscene, like 800 games. I think he's played more than anybody else. Uh, and that's something we were saying, like, will we see that again? You know, uh, I think Scott Brown at Celtic now is on 600 games and, uh, you know, Steven Gerrard, Ryan Giggs, James Milner, uh, who probably surpass uh, Gareth Barry's record if he carries on playing. That's a different era. That's a completely different era to what we have now. Yes, the demands of the game have gone up. You could argue the demands have gone up, so have the demands on staff. We see a lot more staff within a, a performance team now. You know, um, you may have just had a sports scientist 15 years ago that did everything, uh, but now we'll have specialist strength and conditioning, specialist rehab, football fitness specific staff, which I've just seen advertised, and these different things. Um, so I think, yeah, it has changed massively. Like the, 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 the modern day player has changed their demands, their needs have changed. I also think they have a, the, the players now have been used to sports science, physiology, strength and conditioning. They kind of understand the terminology because that's what they're, they're brought up throughout academy systems. So what they require is also a lot different. You know, they have different requirements than somebody that, you know, maybe coming to the end of the career at, you know, 35 now. Um, I've worked with players that, that I, I always used to say that when, when I was at Exeter City, actually, in, in League Two, um, these players would tell me that they, they were kind of caught in a bit of a vacuum where sports science was really new, but not really that acknowledged. And they were coming to the, maybe the end of their career down in the, in, in the lower leagues. And, and they would say, I'm not sure if I'm interested in that. You know, I'm not sure if I've, ever, I've never done that before. So why am I going to do it now? Um, and then you're thinking, well, actually, I'm working with individuals that they played in the Premier League and they're like, they never did it before. Why are they going to do it now? Then you've got another generation that are coming up that understand performance. And then you've got a little bit in the middle that's kind of just been 
push between the two. Um, and, you know, I th I, there's nothing wrong with that. I think it's just the evolution of the game and a modern day player. But I do think the demands of the modern day player are, are, are far greater. Uh, and that's because they have that knowledge now. And Chris, with you, with yourself, sort of, you sort of mentioned there the number, sort of Andrew picked up on the sort of different levels of support that the players have, have now sort of given. Um, just wondered with yourself, um, and obviously in your presentation, you mentioned the sort of importance of taking that responsibility for yourself to support yourself. What are the areas that you found in terms of, you know, supporting yourself, understanding your sort of own physical and mental well-being? What are the practices that you've introduced that are, are probably sort of universal? Obviously, there'll be certain things that were very specific to the, the physical ailments that you, you, you're dealing with. But what, was, what are also the things that were, are universal that you've, you've sort of introduced into your, your lifestyle? Mm. Um, well, the, um, maybe the great thing about uh, the, cr the uh, chronic disease like um, rheumatoid arthritis is that it is everywhere in the body. So, and it is about immune system. And I think the, um, um, the most, Things that I've um, uh, that I was that I have been doing and still do are about um, uh, about my immune system, and um, so I went from this guy that I was just that that was eating meat and uh, uh, thinking that if I uh, if I work out then I need uh, lots of uh, lots of proteins. Uh, for to recover and if I want to get uh, a lot of muscles I need to get all these proteins in and um, um, and then also uh, uh, then also not proteins from plants but um, from animals so those are all those th th these were the beliefs that I was having about well this this specific topic and um, when start reading about what is healthy and what is going to um, um, make sure that you are staying healthy also at an old age. So when I'm 80, although I strive for 110, 120, and I don't know when, but um, maybe 110 years old, am I, still, am I still having this fitness? Am I still having the mental capabilities of, uh, that I think that are healthy? Um, and like most literature then, then uh, points in the direction, well, starts to point in the direction that, uh, for example, a uh, high protein diet is not, not good at all. And uh, that it even um, uh, affects the uh, growth factor in your, in your body and um, that, that it's also linked to, uh, to chronic diseases. So uh, I started to read up on all those things and um, it is, um, uh, to make those personal changes that is very hard because we are like as humans as human beings we we, we like our habits and um we like our meat and uh to change to go to completely vegan um that is a big shift but um for example um i don't think that becoming vegan is uh, uh made um my um disease almost uh, go away but it is and becoming vegan and it's uh, and taking um, and doing a lot of breath work uh, meditation uh, just taking all these different things together so all these lifestyle things uh, made that I have I, I, I was just writing it down because I have a feeling that I uh, don't even got to a level that I am able to perform but it is a even a different, higher level of performing. So um, it feels like it feels like opening up. So as Andrew said, like as a staff member, you need to be fit and healthy to take care of your athletes. But what happens if you think that you are, as a staff member, that you are healthy, but when you change your diet and when you start breathing exercises and when you start doing, for example, uh, yoga and you start doing cold therapy and you start to really work on your health and you discover that there is a whole different level of feeling even much better and 
uh, being able to um, uh, be that open to uh, uh, to all the information that you get from uh, not only from paper but also from other people that you're probably much even much better in uh, in your role than you thought you could be. But it is it is it is quite the 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 luck the luck that I had the luck that I had was that I had this uh, this chronic disease. I see it as a as a as a gift. I see it as a as the luck that I that put me on this path and uh, that I can see now that uh, brings me uh, a lot of joy, a lot of energy. So, um, but if you don't have uh, such an event in your life, it's very hard to uh, to change it. But please do. <laughs> and and it over to you then, Andrew. I know it's sort of carry on with that theme um maybe you've not had such a significant event um but for you how to evolve that kind of understanding that well-being that that balance within within your work understand there are going to be things that you can't control but still allow things not to sort of get out of get out of control yeah i i, I guess for me personally, um, I know myself a lot better than when I was in my twenties. Um, <laughs> I mean, I'm in my mid forties now. So, um, but you know yourself a lot better, and I think you get to know what works for you, what doesn't work for you. Um, sleep. They all laugh at me here because I go to bed early and I get up very early, um, and I've worked out that I'm probably more productive first thing in the morning. Uh, I like to work out, and then I like to get get my day planned um but i think they've come over time of what works best you know i've worked at other clubs where that wasn't the best for me because i couldn't do that because i had other things going on um but i really think you have to try and work out what the best is for you and and, and how you feel because performance uh, is very individual it's very much down to that individual like you know i worked with players that conventional scientific and you're like oh why are they doing that you know like you can go in and go don't do that or you respect that that's their individual routine that's what they do that's how they do things uh, and they're still performing so um i think that's exactly the same with uh, performance staff and someone like myself you get to learn your little routines and habits um and how you're responding to that you become conscious of how you're starting to respond to certain situations like sport is it can be a um, volatile environment at times. It can be. Um, there's a lot of emotion involved. There's a lot that goes on. There's also a lot of change um, that can go on within your day. It can happen within your day, your week, or you know, fixtures being in out a cup or whatever that is. That change can be, at, you know, within a second something can change. You know, being promoted or finished second or whatever that is can. So. Um, you have to get used to to change and try and understand, uh, you know, sometimes that is way out of your control. And we talk a lot in sport about controlling the controllables, but, you know, um, sometimes that can be a little bit cliched at times, you know, control the controllables. Well, what are they? You know, because there's certain things that, you know, in a daily thing that I can't control. And it's like, it's, you know, I call it sort of um, limiting risk. You know, what is the risk to the athlete? What's the risk to myself? And how can we limit that? And how can we uh, try and keep that down? Um, so I think for me personally, it's probably knowing myself a lot better um, understanding that you can't know everything. Um, and there are things that, you know, that are nuanced and in gray areas that you, you, you know, you're not going to understand everything about them. But um, yeah, it's, it's been interesting for me because I found different ways. I know I don't, long journeys don't agree with me that much <laughs> uh, but no I think I, I've learned personally when I'm getting to a point where you know my brain is just foggy and it's like I need to leave the office today and you know take a few hours off and uh, I might have one day a week if I've got it off to just try and not do anything and that includes studies as well and um, you know I, th I think you really again that's very very individual I don't think anyone can go 100 miles an hour for 
for it's a prolonged period of time without some form of crash or or breaking point so i think you have to like the athletes we know where we can push them to we know where we're going to take them and then we know when we're going to rest them there's no reason why we as support staff shouldn't be like that no absolutely absolutely um yeah andrew and chris i think that's a, a great great spot to uh, wrap up the conversation for today um i'd like to thank you both for your for your time and, and sort of sharing your insights and experiences Thank you very much, Steve, for um, yeah, for this for this night, and uh, it was a pleasure. Thank no, thanks, Steve. Really enjoyed it. Uh, some real um, excuse to no pun intended from the nutrition talk, but uh, you know, some food for thought and uh, <laughs> started to make me think there. And uh, no, it's been really good. I'm 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 just waiting on the snow now, so I had to make my day.